Red Rocks, Austin. What is up, guys? Are we doing good? Are we? All right. I need you to do me a favor. Okay. I need you to laugh at my really bad jokes that I'm going to tell. I need you to act like if I say something, it's like really profound. Um, Because I'm going to feel really uncomfortable if it feels like I'm up here talking to myself. But um, hey, I want to say thanks so much for having me. Um, Unfortunately, today on this trip, I had to fly solo. um, And I wasn't able to bring my amazing wife and kid. But I wanted to bring them along in spirit. And so I think we have a picture of them up that's going to be up on the screen here in a minute. Um, That's my beautiful wife, Erin. That's my little girl, Ezra. Um, Ezra is mean mugging the camera because we took like family pictures for the very first time and the only time she smiled was when she was yanking my wife's hair out and so if Aaron was smiling Ezra was frowning and vice versa so um, but that's my amazing wife my beautiful daughter who is the most incredible person in the entire world and before I jump into what I want to talk about tonight I want to say this um, Ethan came up and said a lot of nice things about me. (laughs) It sounded, it made me feel a little weird, but um, you have the best pastors and the best team in the world. And I know that can be awkward and that can seem really forced and fake, like as a guest speaker to come and say, your team's really great. Like, thanks for having me. But um, I'm not kidding when I say this. I, I genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, don't think God could have assembled a better group of people to move to Austin, Texas, and to start a church with Ethan and Steph, Doug and Sam, um, with Ryan, uh, there, with Emily. They're some of my best friends in the entire world. And I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. No church is perfect. No team is perfect. No leadership is perfect. Um, but you guys have some of the best. And I just hope that you're grateful uh, because we miss them. I, Aaron and I miss them back home. Um, and, and you guys are going to have a, an amazing, amazing church that God's continuing to build. You don't have to stay standing, um, by the way. I'm, I've, Doug said the four goes until 730, so I've got like two and a half, three hours up here. So if you guys want to stand, that's great, um, but that is totally on you. Um, but hey, so we have been in a series, you guys have been in a series called Explicit Jesus, And I went through YouTube, listened to all of them, and there was a line that stuck out to me. I don't know if this is like the catchphrase of the series, but Doug said this in the opening line, uh, or the opening message. He said this, he said, when you experience the real Jesus, loving God will not be a problem for you. When you get to experience the real Jesus, loving God is not going to be a problem for you. And I couldn't agree with that statement more because, I mean, have you ever had anybody get the wrong impression of you. Anybody in here, you've ever had a moment where somebody has totally misread you and had the wrong impression of you. It has only happened to me. So you guys will never relate to this situation. But um, so I got hired for a job and my boss brought me in to kind of manage volunteers and and all this stuff. And when I got there, um, our systems for managing volunteers were absolutely chaotic. As a matter of fact, they didn't exist. And so I got into this crazy situation and brought just a little bit of like uniformity and clarity to it. And from that point on, I got pinned like the organized guy and like the systems guy. If, if something is unorganized, go to Connor. He is organized and he will make a system out of it. But if you know me whatsoever, you can attest to my wife. I am the least organized human being in the world. I'm not kidding All I did was take chaos and make smaller chaos, like, in this situation. But my my boss pinned me as the organization guy. And if you could peek inside my brain for a moment, just imagine two people playing ping pong, but then somebody dumps, like, a thousand balls on the table, and they're trying to, like, hit them all at the same time. Like, that's how my brain normally operates. Um, And so I know what it feels like to be pinned something that I'm not. And I think so often we as people can kind of do that to Jesus, right? Like we get the wrong impression of him. We can sometimes come to Jesus with our baggage or maybe uh, we have our interpretation of who we want Jesus to be or who we think that Jesus is. Or maybe we've bought into like the cultural narrative of what Jesus is and who Jesus is. And then we take all of these things, we put them on Jesus and then we're like, if that's how Jesus really is, I don't like him anyway. And Jesus is like, Whoa, like, give me an opportunity to define myself. Give me an opportunity to, like, identify 
myself, you have the wrong impression of me. And I think that statement is so true that when you really get to meet the real Jesus, man, you can't help but fall in love with him because he's amazing. And so tonight, I want to offer up a challenge to anybody in this room and maybe anybody that's watching online. And I just simply want to say this. Um, If you don't believe in Jesus, I'm so honored and glad that you're here and that you're giving us a piece of your time. Um, Walking into a church service or even watching something online that you don't necessarily believe in or agree with um, is a really big first step. And so I want you to, I just want to say thanks so much for giving us your time. Um, And I want to give you a challenge. And this is my only challenge that I'm going to offer you um, if if you don't believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And this is this. I want to give you one simple prayer. And this is your only responsibility for the entire night is this. I just want you to say in your heart, help me to consider the things that are being said tonight. Help me. That's all, that's all I want you to pray or to think about as I'm talking about Jesus tonight is this. Help me to consider the things that are being said tonight. Because I honestly believe that if you come and you can let your guard down a little bit, and all you do is just even consider for a moment that Jesus is real and that he is who he says he is, I think you have an opportunity to meet him. And when you meet him, he will radically change your life for the better. And so... We're going to jump in to the Bible. Um, at Red Rocks, we believe the Bible is the most incredible book ever written. We believe it's not just a book, that it's inspired by God. And we're going to jump in uh, at John chapter 14. John chapter 14, starting at verse 5. Is anybody old school and bring a leather Bible? Anybody bring a Bible? Bonus points, she gets a bigger yard in heaven. Everybody else that's on your phone, you're stuck in a condo in heaven. I'm sorry. Um, no, but uh, it'll be on the screen. Guys, I told you to laugh at my lame jokes. <laughs> there we go. Okay. John uh, 14, verses 5 and 6. And I'm going to give some context to this in a minute, um, so it'll make a little more sense. But Thomas said to him, him being Jesus, he said, Lord, we do not know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Pretty logical question, huh? Jesus answered and he said, Thomas, I am the way. And the Amplified Bible actually says this. He says, Thomas, I'm the only way. I'm the truth. I'm the only truth. I'm the life. I am the only real life. Nobody can come to the Father. Nobody can know God except through me. And so tonight, if you're taking notes, the title of my message is this. It is only Jesus. Only Jesus. And tonight... We're going to define only. This is a a hybrid of Google and my own brain as this exclusive, needing nothing else or having no other options. Only Jesus. We're going to pray and then we're going to jump in and we'll get you out of here in about an hour and a half. All right. All right. Jesus, thank you so much. Help me, Lord. Um, God, we love you so much. And it is such an honor to be here. Um, to just get to contribute the little that I have to offer to building this amazing church here in Austin. God, I pray that every single person under the sound of my voice takes away something from this, that they're encouraged, if they're discouraged, um, that they get peace, if maybe they're going through a season of turmoil, or maybe um, somebody meets you for the very first time and changes their life radically. And so, God, I pray that whatever you want out of this service, whatever you want out of this message, you just do what you want to do. And uh, we thank you, and we look forward to meeting with you tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen and amen. All right, the music's gone. I sound less spiritual. So let's talk. Let's let's have some fun here tonight. Um, Has anybody ever been in a situation, let's say you've gone on a trip or you've traveled, and you... You get to your destination or you're almost at your destination and you realize you have forgotten like the one very essential thing you needed to go on this trip. Has anybody ever been in a situation like that? All right. I'm not alone. Um, Recently, near the beginning of the year, my wife and I took a trip out to Missouri, God's country. 
or maybe lack of God's country. I'm not sure. We went to, we went to Lake of the Ozarks um, to visit some friends that had moved from Denver back to Missouri. And for me, this was a big trip, um, not because going to Missouri is awesome, but because it was the first time that I was going on a trip with my little girl. I was so excited. And be- before I kind of continue, I have another question. Sorry, I'm throwing a lot at you guys. Who here, when they go on a trip, you sort of pre-plan your outfits and you set them out and, and you kind of pack in outfits. Anybody do that? Okay, who throws everything they own into a bag and you're like, I'll figure it out when I get there? All right, you're my people. I'm not kidding. If you could see my suitcase for this two-day trip that I took, I could be here for a month and be totally fine and not have to do laundry or anything. I don't know why. That's just how I'm wired. It's because I'm organized and I'm a systems guy, right? So... <laughs> Um, But so we're going on this trip to Missouri, and we have everything brand new parents would have to travel. I mean, we've read the blogs, we've watched the videos, we've taken the classes. I mean, we are about as rookie as you can be at this. And so we have about 38 suitcases. We have my suitcase, my second suitcase for my shoes. My wife has a suitcase. Ezra's got like two suitcases. We've got a little pack and play. We've got her car seat. We've got her stroller. And we get onto this bus, this shuttle, to go to Denver Airport, and it looks like we are moving somewhere. And so we've got our like 28 bags and we, we load them all up and we are pulling up to the airport. And I have this moment of just stress and panic. And I realized that I had left my backpack in our car back in the parking lot. Now, if my backpack only had like a book or let's say my Bible, because I'm, I'm a pretty holy guy, so I bring my Bible everywhere I go. Um, that was a joke again, but okay. <laughs> oh man, okay. Um, but I left... <laughs> I left my bag in my car and we pull up to the airport and Aaron notices this like panic on my face and like the sweat starting to to form on my forehead. And she's like, babe, what's wrong? And I'm like, I left my freaking backpack in the car. And because we're new parents, we are late to everything. And so we're like feeling this pressure and this rush already to get on a plane. And I wouldn't have cared if my backpack only had a few things in it, but it actually had my ID, Ezra's ID. It had our tickets. It had, I think, my wife's purse kind of tucked in there with it. It had everything we actually needed to go on the trip. So because I'm a great husband and I'm having a panic attack, my wife gets back on the bus to go get my backpack for me. Well, I'm standing in DIA with 42 bags and a crying baby, and we make it to our trip on time. But I want to tie this in here. Isn't this feeling, can't, isn't this so familiar to us? Like, can't we so often relate to this when it comes to our faith or maybe our relationship with Jesus, right? Where we can get so wrapped up in other things. Maybe it's good things, like even God things, church things, religious things, but we can get so wrapped up in life or the things that we have going on that we can actually forget the most important thing, which is a relationship with Jesus. Now, earlier together, we read uh, John chapter 14, two verses, and I want to go back to that, and I want to give you guys some context to what's going on in our story. Um, And I think it can speak to our condition on how we can easily get so distracted from keeping Jesus the only focus, our main focus of our pursuit with a relationship with God. John chapter 13, it's a really famous story. It is the story of the Last Supper. And so instead of just reading this whole chapter to you, I'm going to do what I call the CGS version, which is the Conor Grimm Summary. Um, It's very theologically sound, so don't worry about it. But um, no, uh, I kind of want to share some observations that I have from this story. Because I think one thing that we do as Christians is we often romanticize stories in the Bible, right? We open the Bible and we feel like we hear, "Ah," like every time we open it and read it. And we kind of give this like reverence to some of the stories. But if we're being honest... Some of the stories in the Bible are really tense, really awkward, and really weird. So, for example, John chapter 13, Jesus is starting to act a little strange. 
we're just going to be honest. John chapter 13, Jesus is getting pretty cryptic and, and a little prophetic about what is about to happen to him. All the disciples, they've come together in Jerusalem. They've gathered together to have this amazing meal, which is one of the biggest Jewish holidays on the calendar. And they notice Jesus isn't acting like his normal self. To start, Jesus, as food was getting prepared and set on the table, Jesus gets up, like takes off his outer garment, I guess like his cloak or whatever Jesus wore, wraps it around his waist, and starts washing the disciples' feet. Now, for us, that can seem kind of cool because we know the purpose behind it. But picture this. Imagine if Doug, Ethan, and Ryan stood at the door, took their shirts off, tied it around their waist, and rubbed hand sanitizer on your all's hands while you came in for the service. I imagine that's kind of what the disciples felt in this moment. Like, why is Jesus, why is my leader getting up, taking his robe off, tying it around his waist, and washing My feet. And we know that it's awkward and we know that it's uncomfortable because one of the disciples, Peter, he actually speaks up and he's like, hey, Jesus, stop. Like, what are you doing? You're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus actually says, Peter, you don't know what I'm doing. I'm about to explain it to you. But if I can't wash your feet, you don't have any part of what I'm doing here. You don't have any part of me. And then Peter responds. and He's like, if that's the case, if you have to wash my feet, Jesus, wash all of me. And Jesus is like, gross, dude, I'm not giving you a bath. That's like, that's too far. And Peter's like awkwardly standing there and all of his friends heard him and he feels like really uncomfortable. <laughs> but Jesus, you know, that, that, if we're just being honest, Jesus washing the feet, Peter not knowing what's going on. That's, if we're honest with the Bible, that's kind of weird, right? That, that's kind of strange. And then dinner begins to be passed around and the Bible says actually out of anguish in his heart Jesus randomly just blurts out he goes one of you guys is going to betray me tonight imagine that imagine you're sitting at a table having dinner with one of your closest friends one of your leaders and just out of nowhere you're all talking about fantasy football or whatever and he's like one of you guys is going to betray me like it kind of put puts you on edge a little bit right And the disciples, they have no idea what he's talking about. And it says they start to whisper and they start to ask each other, like, what is this guy doing? And then John, the one where we get this story, says he leans over on Jesus' chest, which is like, okay, John, you didn't have to go that far, but whatever. And he's like, Jesus, what are you talking about? Who is going to betray you? And Jesus says to John, he goes, I'm going to take this bread and dip it in whatever dip Jesus preferred. And whoever I give this to is going to be the one that betrays me. Now, I don't know if Judas wasn't paying attention in this moment, or I don't know if he couldn't have heard this, because this seems like a pretty obvious tell. But if I was Judas, there's nothing you could have done to get me to take that bread out of Jesus' hands. Am I right? Like, Jesus is like, dunk, here you go, buddy. And I'd be like, no, I'm good. I swear, Bartholomew, he looks a little more hungry than I am. You can give that to him. But apparently that wasn't obvious enough to the disciples because, get this, Jesus, he dips the bread, he gives it to Judas. Then he looks at Judas and he says, what you're about to do, go do quickly. And clearly, for whatever reason, the dots were not connecting for these people because it says the disciples didn't know what was going on. And they thought that Judas was leaving to go give money to the poor. Because Judas was kind of like the Jesus and his disciples accountant of the day. He took care of the money. And so they thought that's where he was going. How random and tense is this story? I think we read over it with this just like flowery biblical language. But if you, if you sit in it for a moment, it is very weird and very uncomfortable. But then it continues to actually get weirder because Jesus starts back up on his cryptic prophetic kick. And after Judas leaves, he starts saying, hey, I just want to let you guys know I'm about to be betrayed and I'm going to die and I'm going to leave you. And when I leave you, you can't really come to where I'm going quite yet. And Peter, because he already embarrassed himself, so I feel like he's like, I got nothing else to lose. He's like, hey, Jesus, where are you going? You keep on making these like very vague comments about like you're leaving and we can't go, but we kind of know like, Jesus, where are you going? Why can't I come? And Jesus responds and he says, you just can't go where I'm going quite yet. And Peter, he gets fired up. And this is what I love about him. He's like, Jesus, do you not know that I would die for you? 
Why can't I come to this very vague place that you keep like kind of mentioning? And Jesus says, you can't come yet, but don't worry. You know where I'm going to go. And then finally, another disciple at the table speaks up. His name is Thomas. And I feel bad for Thomas because Thomas kind of gets a bad rap. We know him as doubting Thomas because when Jesus came back from the dead, he didn't believe it until he got to touch Jesus where they crucified him and put his hand in his side and all of that. But in this moment, I don't think Thomas is being doubtful. I think Thomas is actually being very practical and very real. We see that Thomas, he kind of speaks up and he says what I believe every single one of us would be thinking if we're sitting at that table with Jesus. He says, Jesus, listen. We've been hanging out for a while, and I know you. And you're in this weird, sort of cryptic mood, and I get it. That's cool. You know, like, it, it, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable here at dinner, but you just keep on doing your thing. He's like, you've started to say these things to us, and we're laughing, and we're smiling, and we're passing the wine, and we're passing the bread, and that's, that's awesome. But you keep on making these references that you're leaving You keep on telling us that where you are going, we can't go, but not to worry because we know the way and we know how to get there and that you're going to come back and take us. Jesus, where are you going? Why can't we go? Because, Jesus, you keep saying that we know the way, but he goes, I don't know the way to what you're talking about. I don't know how to get to where you say you're going. Jesus, I'm telling you, I don't. Know the way. And as I was reading that, it really just kind of jumped out in my heart this past week of like, man, is there anybody else in this room that can really relate to that feeling? The where you feel like you've spent a lot of your life following Jesus and, and doing the things that you know followers of Jesus should do. But you get to this place in your relationship with him where you're like, Jesus, I feel like. You're taking me somewhere, but if I'm honest, I don't really know the way. I feel like I'm starting to lose my way. I can imagine that there's got to be more than me in here that knows that feeling of walking with Jesus, but feeling like you're losing your way. And I want you to see Jesus' response to Thomas in this moment. This is the context of the verse we read earlier. He says this. John 14, 6, he says, Thomas, I am the way. I'm the truth and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Amplified Bible says this, Thomas, I am the only way to have a relationship with God. I am the only way to get to the place where your soul has its deepest, most passionate longings and desires. Thomas, you're overthinking this. It's it's me. It's me. He said, and, and what I think he's saying to us in here tonight is the same thing he's saying to Thomas. If you're in here tonight and you feel like you're losing your way a little bit, maybe you've walked in and you love Jesus, but if you're being honest, COVID has gotten the best of you and maybe your income has taken a hit and maybe your friendships, you're worried about your health, you're worried about your friend's health or your family's health. And maybe over COVID where you started off strong in a relationship with Jesus, but if you're being honest, your soul just kind of feels like, I used to know the way, but now I feel like I'm not quite sure I know the way. I think the invitation of Jesus still stands for us tonight, which is come to me because I am the way. But I want to ask you guys an honest question in here um, because I think deep within our souls, we would know the right answer. We would know that Jesus is the only way to get our, our soul, our spirit's deepest longings and desires fulfilled. But I have a question for you. If, if we know that in theory, why is it so easy for us to lose focus on only Jesus? Why is it so easy as people that do our best to follow after him to constantly feel distracted or that we're adding something else to the invitation of pursuing Jesus and only Jesus. For just a few more minutes, I want to talk about two ways in which I believe we lose sight of the invitation to have our soul focus solely 
on who Jesus is. The two main ways we can lose sight on only Jesus. The first one is this, Jesus and fill in the blank. Jesus and fill in the blank with your drug of choice. Jesus and, I think the first thing, and honestly the most common way that we lose sight of only Jesus is this. And if you're taking notes, write this down because I think this is important. When a good thing in our life becomes the main thing of our life, instead of simply staying a good thing in our life. One of the easiest ways that we can lose sight as people of having our soul, our life fixated on the person of Jesus is when a good thing that is supposed to be a good thing starts to become the main thing in our life instead of staying simply a good thing. I think we as humans have such an incredible habit of taking good things and making them main things when they were never meant to be main things. I think Ethan mentioned it earlier. I'm a young adults pastor in Denver. And so I see this happen literally on a weekly basis. What do you think is the number one desire? And I'm sure I see a lot of people here kind of in this age range of a 20 year old's like heart. What do you, what do you think of the main desire is? A relationship, right? I have so many relationship conversations on a Thursday night, it would blow your mind. I literally could guess. Like, uh, you can just tell by the posture of somebody's body when they're walking up to you that they're stressed about a relationship or lack thereof, right? I see it so often in young adults. And here, here's kind of what it looks like. You get somebody that comes to YA and they are passionate. They are on fire. They love Jesus. They're on fire for their church and they're serving their church. They want to reach their friends. They want to reach their office. They want to reach where they go hang out or eat dinner, get drinks, whatever. Like they are on fire for Jesus. But they're also single. And they so desperately want to be in a relationship, which may I add, is a good thing. It is an amazing thing. It is a blessed thing. It is a gift from God kind of thing. But a week goes by, and they're still single. And then two weeks go by, and they're still single. And a month goes by, am I preaching to anybody, and they're still single. And then a year goes by, and they're still single. And two years, help me, Lord, find a man goes by. And they're still single. Jesus, I'll take anybody that's breathing goes by. And they're still single. And what happens? Compromise begins to take place. Because fear starts to set in. And we begin to wonder, is only Jesus really enough to satisfy the deepest desires of my soul? Is really Jesus, is Jesus really that good? Is he, is only having Jesus really so good that he's the only thing I need to put my heart's attention to if I'm going to find fulfillment in the deepest parts of my soul? And what happens in this moment is a good desire from a young adult, a really good, healthy, amazing desire becomes the main desire of their life. And I see it all the time. And instead of Jesus being the main desire, it becomes Jesus and a relationship is going to be the thing that gives my heart what it needs the most. And I mean, think about it. We see this happen even in our story in John chapter 13. I want to look at a character we don't talk about quite often in church, but his name is Judas. And if you cringed a little bit, you probably should. He's not that great of a dude. But I want to talk about Judas because we see this happen in Judas's life. Now, I want to think, because whenever we hear Judas, we normally think, terrible guy that betrayed Jesus to die, and rightfully so. But Judas has a bit of a backstory. Think about this. Judas was walking around Galilee at some point and heard Jesus talking. And found him so compelling that he was willing to give up everything that was going on in his life at that point to follow this traveling teacher, this God incarnate teacher, and learn the ways of God. Judas traveled around listening to the most famous sermons that we have recorded in our Bible. Judas sat and watched Jesus pray for people and heal people. He watched Jesus bring a dead man back to life. Judas fell in love 
at a point in his life with the person of Jesus. But there was also a moment where Judas started to elevate something else in his life to the point where a good thing became the main thing instead of staying a good thing, and that was money. Money is not a bad thing. I think sometimes churches either make us feel guilty for money or they push us to give as much money as we possibly can. Um, and it's good to give money to your church. That's, that's a good, that's a healthy thing. But money in and of itself is not evil. Money is a very neutral thing. It's a good thing. God can give people money because they're generous. But what happened in Judas's heart is a good thing became the main thing. And what happened, just like it does in relationships in our life, Judas compromised. And there's a moment in his life where he thought that if he could just get a little more money, maybe that could answer that deep feeling of unsatisfaction that he felt in his soul. And we know the story. We just kind of read it. Judas sells Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. And I don't believe that Judas was totally evil in this moment. We read in Matthew 27 that actually when he finds out that they're going to crucify Jesus and kill him, he runs back to the temple and he throws the money on the ground and he's like, I don't want this anymore because he realized it wasn't in Jesus and money. It was an only Jesus that his soul could be satisfied. And I wonder how many of us in this room tonight, if we're being honest and we take inventory in our soul, if you've come to Red Rocks Austin tonight, you're sitting in this room or maybe you're listening online somewhere and you say, man, if I'm being honest, I feel distant from God. If I'm being completely transparent, I feel like Jesus and I haven't been connecting. I feel like Thomas in that story where when I pray to God, I feel like I don't know the way anymore. I wonder if tonight, if you took inventory of your soul, if you have made a good thing, the main thing, instead of allowing it to be a good thing. I know I have. I know I've done this hundreds of thousands of times in my relationship with Jesus. And all the while, Jesus continues to beckon me to refocus, to recenter, to take down the idol and continue to elevate who he is. And there and only there is where my soul finds love and it finds joy and it finds peace and it finds rest. And band, you guys can come on up. I'm not gonna be too much longer. Just about 45 more minutes. <laughs> I've only got two points for you guys, so I could throw in a third, but I'm going to be nice. I think adding something to Jesus is a really easy way to get distracted, and I think it's the most common. But I think this is a very close runner-up, and it's this. Feeling pressure to prove or to perform. Feeling pressure to prove or to perform. For Jesus, man, can I ever relate to this? If I'm being totally transparent with you guys, this is the biggest battle that I face in my relationship with Jesus is this feeling that I have to prove to Jesus how much I love him, this, this feeling that I have to perform for him to make him accept me, right? That I have to work, that I have to act, that I have to do something for God to show him that I'm worth him loving. And this is so Peter. This is so Peter from our story earlier, right? Like Peter is this passionate and impulsive guy, but I honestly think if we could talk to him, this would be his main struggle in his life when he gets distracted from the only thing that matters, which is Jesus. Because think about our story. Jesus says, Peter, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to wash your feet. And Peter says, no, 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 no. Let me prove to you how much I love you and I will wash your feet. He says, Jesus, I'm going to follow you anywhere. When Jesus says, you can't follow me where I'm going right now, he says, no, I will prove to you. I will follow you. Jesus says, Peter, you're going to deny me. No, I will never deny you. I will show you. I will prove to you. Peter, you're, you're, you're going you're gonna to deny me. You're going to give up on me. And he's like, no, Jesus, I'll die for you before I ever do anything like that. Jesus, you can count on me. I'll show you. I'll prove it to you. I'll perform for you. And listen, this is so dangerous because in the moment it feels so holy and right. This is so dangerous to our soul because it feels so holy. It feels so righteous. It feels so Christian-y to come to God and say, look what I've done. 
Look at all the good choices I've made. Look at all the, the money I've given away. Look at all the times where I could have been mad and said a cuss word, but I didn't. All the times I could have flipped somebody off in traffic, but I gave them a thumbs up. Like, look at all the ways I've performed for you. I've showed you that I love you. But if we're being honest in here, if you ever feel like you have to struggle with proving your worth to God, proving your love to God, proving that you're worth saving, proving you're sorry after you've done the thing you said you would never do again, again and again and again. If you ever feel tired uh, and you know what it's like to feel like you have to dance and perform for a God that is waiting for you to mess up just so you can continue the cycle of proving your love over again. You would know what I know, which is, man, it is exhausting. There is literally nothing more exhausting to the human soul than to perform for a God who has already proven his love for you. It is exhausting to have to do that dance when you were never asked to dance in the first place. Because here's what happens, and this is how it distracts us from the main thing. Instead of our eyes focusing on only Jesus, our eyes begin to focus on only what we can do to perform for him. Instead of fixating our eyes, fixating our gaze on, on what Jesus has already done to show his love and prove his love to us, we fixate on ourselves and, and try to think of all the things that we have to do to prove our love for him. And this mindset kicks in that if I work hard enough and I act well enough and I do enough, then I'll show God that I'm worthy of his love and I'm worthy of his attention, and I'm worthy of his gifts, and I'm worthy of his promises, and I guarantee you that'll leave you in one place, spiritual exhaustion. Because Jesus said, it's only through me that you find that life and that peace that your soul is searching for. Peter, he, his story doesn't get much better until Acts, if I'm being totally honest. Uh, Jesus is betrayed by Judas while he's praying and a soldier comes and most scholars would agree Peter cuts off the, the soldier's ear and it sounds pretty cool in the moment until Jesus grabs it and puts it right back on his head and he's like, don't do that, man. <laughs> Jesus, I told you I'll never leave you. <laughs> Chill out. <laughs> then Jesus is being beaten and tortured and questioned and a little girl goes up to Peter and she's like, you know that guy, don't you? He's like, no, 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 not, not me. Everything that Jesus said would happen to Peter happened. And what happens to a performer, what happens to somebody who feels like you have to prove yourself, you will every time, I promise you, eventually you're gonna fail. And what happens is when you fail, you feel like God doesn't love you because you're focused on your performance instead of what Jesus has already done. And the cycle continues, but this time it has to be more. You have to prove even more now. You have to perform even better now. You have to have a longer streak of not saying or not looking at or not doing this to show how sorry you are and how much you love Jesus. But this is what I love about Jesus. Peter is deflated. He feels defeated. Jesus has died. But Peter doesn't know this yet. He rose from the grave because he is who he said he is. He's God incarnate. Death can't hold him or touch him. And so Peter has retired his life to this once passionate follower of Jesus to a simple fisherman, a very common trade in that area. And Jesus goes to the beach where Peter is fishing. And it says that Peter sees him from afar and recognizes him and jumps out of the boat because he's passionate and impulsive. And I can imagine him just like splashing to shore, like getting to Jesus. And Jesus asks him in the moment what feels like a really peculiar question. He says, Peter, do you love me? And of all the things a risen Savior could say to a performer, I think it's very intentional that Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, yeah, Jesus, of, of course I love you. And Jesus asks him again, he says, Peter, do you love me? Like, do you love me? And I think what Jesus is doing in this moment is he's taking Peter's eyes off of his failure and putting them right back to where they need to be for Peter to experience life and joy and peace, which is back on to him, back on to Jesus. Peter, do you love me? Yes, why do you keep asking me this? Because you need to focus on me. 
If there's anybody in this room tonight, you've come in here and you feel worn out, you feel exhausted. If you're honest, your soul just feels like, I have lost my way. Can I encourage you that it is only Jesus where you will find rest and you will find peace and you will find satisfaction for your soul. It's only in Jesus. It's not in Jesus in sex. It's not in Jesus in money. It's not in Jesus in whatever. And it's not performing or dancing to prove yourself to him. I think the invitation is so simple that sometimes we struggle with it. It is to simply come to him and you will find everything your soul is looking for. With every head bowed, every eye closed, and if you're watching this online, I want you to respond the same. I just kind of want to know, is there anybody in here tonight that just relates to what I've been talking about, that you came in and if you're honest, you just feel tired, worn out, like you've lost your way. Would you just pop your hand up real quick? I want to pray for you. Yeah, hands everywhere, my hands up. I'm going to pray for you here in a moment, but is there anybody in this room and anybody watching, I don't care where you are online, maybe you're in here tonight and maybe you were the person that I was talking to before service started where you don't necessarily buy into all this Jesus stuff, but maybe you prayed that prayer of help me to consider what's being said tonight. And maybe you opened your heart and you considered and you feel like maybe the first time Jesus actually spoke to you. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Would you put your hand up? Even if you're online, if you're at your house, if you're on your couch, if you're in your office, you just said, you know what? I've never really encountered God and I didn't believe in this really, but I felt like for some reason, Jesus spoke to me. Here's what I want you to do. I'm gonna pray for everybody in this room. And there's no magic prayer that saves you. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart, you're saved. That word saved is all encompassing. He wants to transform your life. I'm gonna pray for you guys. And if that was you, if you lifted up your hand, here's what I wanna encourage you to do. I'm gonna pray for you. I want you to speak to Jesus for the first time, just how you would speak to anybody else. Thank him for talking to you. If you're going through something, talk to him about it. Invite him into your heart. We're gonna pray.